if you would uh, turn in your Bibles, if you'd like to follow along the reading of the Word, to Mark chapter 11. Mark chapter 11. I'm going to read verses 15 through 19. Mark 11, verses 15 through 19. Would you listen carefully to this? This is God's word. And they came to Jerusalem, and he entered the temple and began to cast out those who were buying and selling in the temple and overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who were selling doves. And he would not permit anyone to carry goods through the temple. And he began to teach and say to them, is it not written, My house shall be called a house of prayer for all the nations? But you have made it a robber's den. And the chief priests and the scribes heard this and began seeking how to destroy him. For they were afraid of him. For all the multitude were astonished at his teaching. And whenever evening came, they would go out of the city. May the Lord bless his word to our, our hearing this morning. Now, if you'll recall, uh, last time we were looking at uh, the verses that just preceded this having to do with the cursing of the fig tree and, of course, the explanation or what actually happened in verses beyond this. Uh, Jesus enters into Jerusalem, and he sees the fig tree and leaf. He went there looking for food, but found that it didn't have any on it, so he cursed the fig tree and they went out of the city, came back in the morning. Peter notes, look, Jesus, the fig tree that you've, cur that you've cursed is now withered. How did that happen? Well, Jesus again brought two lessons from that. And again, we, we, we need to remember this because this is a recurring theme in Scripture, the idea of bearing fruit. Why did Jesus curse the fig tree? Knowing that it wasn't the season for figs, knowing that he wasn't going to find fruit on it, why did he go there? Why did he look for fruit? Why did he curse it? And the, the reason being is because it was a picture of him coming to his people year after year looking for fruit, but Israel wasn't bearing that fruit because they didn't love the Lord and they weren't serving him. Not all of them, but most of them. And because of that, they were close to being cursed. You know that 70 AD was not that far away when the Lord was going to sweep them away forever because they weren't bearing fruit. Now, again, the Bible says that every true believer will bear fruit. John 15, Jesus says that the Father even prunes those branches in him that do bear fruit, that they might bear more fruit. But those branches that don't bear fruit, he cuts off, men gather them, and throw them into the fire. Now, again, that's another illustration, another example of what will happen, as Jesus says on another occasion regarding those that were entrusted with the minas, if your mina doesn't earn anything more for the Lord, if you're not bearing fruit, if your talent doesn't make any more talents for the Lord, then you're really not a true believer because Jesus says every branch in me will bear fruit. There are branches that look like they're in me, but they're not bearing fruit. Well, those get cut off, they get thrown into the fire. But those that bear fruit are the true believers. They're the ones who love the Lord. They're the ones who bear fruit with patience. They're the ones who are going to be reward it. So again, a reminder that if you're not bearing fruit, examine your life. Make sure that you're trusting in Jesus Christ. You have to trust him alone for your salvation before you're going to be able to do what the Lord says you must do, that these things must be true of you if you were to enter into the kingdom of heaven. But let's not forget the encouragement also that came with this example. When Jesus pointed to the tree and he says, what I did to the fig tree, you will do as well if you don't doubt. As a matter of fact, if you say to this mountain, be taken up and cast into the sea, it will obey you. But the key is you have to not doubt. You have to ask in faith. And as we saw before, the only way that you can do that is if God has given you a promise that gives you the expectation that he will hear that prayer and answer it. You just can't ask for anything that you want. I'd like a billion dollars here. I'd like a mansion here. I'd like this nice car over here. Because God hasn't given you a promise to give you those things. 
But he has made many promises, many very precious promises. He will take care of your needs. He will give you everything that has to do with life and godliness. Every promise that God has made in his word, you can pray and you can know that he has heard that petition and you know that he will answer it. Jesus says, though, you have to believe that he's trustworthy, that he will do as he said. And if you believe that, he will answer you. Jesus told his disciples on one occasion, until now you've asked for nothing in my name. Ask that your joy may be full. Ask that you may receive, he says. So let's make sure that we don't forget to ask for those things that the Lord has told us that we may ask for, knowing that he will give them to us. Now this morning we see Jesus come to the temple. And as we've already seen, he was offended by what he saw. The leaders of Israel, instead of protecting the holiness of God, were actually allowing this place of worship to be turned into a robber's den. Basically, the leaders were profiteering from the worship of God's people. You know, what was all this merchandising that was going on inside the temple? Well, as I understand it, um, uh, you know, people would bring their animal sacrifices to the temple. That's where those things would be sacrificed. But the animals they brought were not good enough. But, of course, the people who were inside the temple had animals that were good enough, and they were willing to sell them to them. Also, the money changers, what were they exchanging exactly there? Well, the fact is the money that you brought is not the right kind of currency. You need temple currency so you can exchange your money for our money so you can make an offering to the Lord. But, of course, we get our cut. We get our percentage. What was happening here is that instead of it being what it should be, which was a house of prayer, a place of worship, a place to honor the Lord, they had actually turned it into a place where the leaders could make money. It had become a place of greed a place of extorting, uh, again, money from God's people in order to benefit. And so Jesus, seeing these things, out of zeal for his Father's honor, cleanses the temple, overthrowing the tables, and drives them all out. Now, again, I believe what we have here this morning is not only fulfilled prophecy, because it was certainly foretold in Scripture, that the Lord of the covenant would suddenly come to his temple and he would purify the sons of Levi that they might offer sacrifices in righteousness. Certainly that is the case. But what, what I want us to see here is the example, the example that Jesus gives to us, because that is really where it connects with our lives. Everything that Jesus did in his life was an example for us of his love for the Father, his zeal, his desire to serve him, his actual service, his service to his disciples. And I believe the Lord wants us to follow in this example as well. So how should we follow this example? Well, I want us to see two things this morning. First of all, we need to follow his example of zeal for God's glory. As I've mentioned earlier in the service, none of us can actually own up to the kind of zeal God wants us to have. All of us are divided to one degree or another between the Lord and the world, and to that degree it is hurting us and it's making us less useful. We need to be more zealous for the Lord. And that's true of all of us. And it will be as long as we are in this world. We're not going to be perfect till we get to heaven. But that doesn't mean we don't strive for perfection. But the second point is, in your zeal for the Lord, you must be willing to pay the price for that zeal, which is going to be, of course, hatred from those who don't love the Lord. So first of all, you need to be zealous for God's glory. And again, Jesus saw what these people were doing. By the way, these were not the people of the world. Although I do think, certainly from what we see in the example of the apostles, we do need to make Christ known to the world. But I think more specifically, Jesus here is addressing the sins of his own people. Because who were these Jews after all? They weren't the world. And this temple, was this, I mean, was this just some kind of a a secular building that had been built out there for some, you know, some type of worship of pagan gods? No, this was the true temple of the true God. And Jesus is dealing with them. They had turned the worship of God into a business. And they were more interested in making money 
than they were in honoring the Lord. Now, as I've said that, I hope it's kind of you know, reminded you of the fact that the same thing is going on in a number of so-called churches today. People are profiteering. So many churches today don't want to preach the truth because the truth is offensive and people don't like to hear it. They don't want to have biblical worship because biblical worship to them is boring and a lot of people don't want to worship the Lord in a biblical way and so they don't do that. Instead, they run entertainment. They run programs. They make it like a show. I heard not too long ago in a, in a worship service that was done on the Lord's Day that there was this, uh, this big to-do. This, uh, this person came out on the, on the stage who was dressed like a cowboy and he had his hand on a gun that was holstered, you know, it was like, uh, you know, this, this uh, holster and so forth and a six shooter. And as he walks out on stage with his, with his head down like this, he raises it up and suddenly everybody realizes it's the pastor and they begin to applaud him. Now the question I would have is, why in the world would you even do that in a worship service? What does that have to do with honoring God at all? Along with a lot of other things that are going on. Well, the reason why you do things like that is because people like it. It's entertaining. It's, it's fun. Biblical worship is enjoyable, and it is fun for true believers, but not for people who are not. And I think pretty much everybody knows that if, it, well, many people do know, especially pastors, that if you do things according to the book, if you do things according to the Bible, it's not going to be that popular because there just aren't that many people who really love the Lord the way that they should. They know that if they do things this way, the congregations are going to be small. If they're small, then they're going to be deemed unsuccessful. If it's small, it's not going to make much money, and they're not going to make much money, and so forth. The point is that even as it did in the temple, so it can do today. Greed can overcome truth. The love of money, the Bible says, is the root of all sorts of evil. That's what was happening in Jesus' day, and that's what's happening today. So what did Jesus do? He drove them all out for the reasons that we've seen. And I want you to notice in this text, it says <coughs> that he not only drove out those who were selling, but he also drove out those who were buying. I thought that was interesting. Because what it means is that the people who were submitting to that and engaged in that same dishonoring you know, business that was going on in the temple were dishonoring the Lord along with everyone else. So whether you're the instigator or the participant in this, you're still dishonoring God. But as I said, Jesus cleansed the temple and Jesus also went on to point out their error and to show them what the house was for. It was for worship, it was for prayer, for all nations. A place to bring him honor, a place to seek after him. It was not a place to extort people of their money. Now again, what, what does this teach you? I mean, how can we apply this to our lives today? I mean, after all, you know, that is not our temple the way it was Jesus' temple. And the church is not our church the way it belongs to him. And yet Jesus is our example. So what is he actually teaching you to do here? Well, I think the main point is you need to love the Father. You need to love God. And of course, Jesus is God. You need to love him too. You need to love Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And you need to have a zeal for his honor and his glory. Jesus loved his Father, and he wanted him to be honored. And so what he saw angered him. When you love someone, you can't help but be provoked when you see that one whom you love being dishonored. When you see that happening, love moves you to do something about it. Now, the question I believe this, this passage is asking us this morning is this. How much does your love move you when you see the Lord dishonored? Does it make you angry? When you see the one whom you love more than anyone else, at least that's what we're supposed to do as Christians, right? The greatest commandment is love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, 
and strength. Jesus says, if you're going to follow after me, everything else that you love and everyone else that you love has to be a distant second, so much so that you hate them by comparison. Jesus said on one occasion, unless you hate your father, your mother, your wife, your children, your possessions, you cannot be my disciple. Now, we know that Jesus didn't mean literally hate those people or those things, but he did mean in comparison to his love or to your love for him, you have to, by comparison, hate them. Now, if you love God that much, aren't you offended? Aren't you provoked? Aren't you angry with a, with a righteous anger when you see God being mistreated in this way? I mean, are you offended when unbelievers do things that dishonor him? What about when believers do it? Again, Jesus was addressing not the world here, although in a sense it was the world, because they were unconverted, but they were still within his church. This is the way he dealt with them. Are you offended when you see people who call themselves Christians doing things that you know are dishonoring to God? And, and I hope you understand there's a lot of that going on today. Now, we do need to be careful here, and we don't want to be uncharitable, because we do know that there are many churches that do what they do because they believe that they're seeking to honor the Lord. Okay? They may be mistaken. They may be sincere in what they're doing, but it's, of course, still wrong. Now, in a case like that, we do need to be patient. We do need to be gentle. I don't think Jesus would um, take one of his people who you know, he, he knew was sincerely trying to do what's right and was just misguided. I don't think he would have taken you know, the whip and scourge them, as it were, but he would do that with those who he knew were seeking to profiteer, those whom he knew had a bad intent and motive. When we see people who are misguided and people who just don't understand, you know, we just need to make sure that we deal gently with them, realizing that you know, there are things that we believe and things that we do that may be dishonoring to the Lord as well, but we still hold them sincerely because that's what we believe the Bible is teaching. But we do need to remember as well that there are other churches that clearly are not seeking to honor the Lord, and they're doing it on purpose. It's, you know, we can't read hearts, but I think you know, there are boundaries to what might even be considered plausible as far as what a person might believe the Bible teaches. There are people who market Christianity, people who are leading in this and people who are following it, and according to what we see here, dishonor the Lord in what they're doing. In a case like that, as we did in, in the case of the other people, we need to be willing to deal with them. We need to be willing to try to help them see the truth and turn them into the truth. Again, depending upon where they are actually you know, in in their relationship with the Lord, whether it is a relationship or not, and how far they're going and dishonoring him, we do need to deal uh, consistently with that. Now, how far should you go in dealing with people like this? Well, Jesus made a scourge, and he drove them out of the temple. Does that mean that you should make a scourge and begin to whip people when you see, thing, see them doing things or believing things that aren't uh, biblical? No, you, you shouldn't, of course, because you don't have the right to do that. That happened to be Jesus' temple. That happened to be his people, and he was the creator, and he had the right to do that to these people, but we don't have that same right. We have to do things that are consistent with what we are, and we need to do it in the way the Lord has called us to do it. Now, there may be a time when we need to, in righteous anger, rebuke someone for their sin because they're doing something clearly dishonoring to the Lord. There are other times when we deal gently. I think pretty much all we can do is speak. We need to tell them. But I think the point here is that we need to have a, a strong enough love to want to tell them and that we actually need to talk to them. Now again, I think we should do it as graciously as we possibly can, as the situation will allow us to do, but we do need to do it. I mean, there is a reason why people continue on in ignorance. And there's a reason why, you know, leaders continue to lead their people down this road. It's because they go unchallenged. Well, who's supposed to challenge them? 
well, it's, it's that person over there or that person or this guy who wrote this book or this guy who has this show over here. It's not my responsibility. Or is it? You see, we all have our spheres of influence. And as the Lord brings somebody into our sphere of influence, as we meet somebody, as they cross our path providentially, we need to do what we can to help them, especially if they happen to be another brother or sister in the Lord, to escape a particular error that is hurting them in some way. And we do need to remember that um, error, things that are false, will always hurt us in some way. Some things are really bad. I mean, if you get the fundamentals of the faith wrong, then you'll miss heaven. That's really bad. That will really hurt you. And those are the ones you need to deal with first and foremost. But if it's one of those areas, again, where churches disagree, well, again, it won't hurt you as badly, but it will still hurt you to some degree. Any, any place we get off track, anything we misunderstand in Scripture, anything that we don't do according to God's will is going to hurt us in some way or another. So we need to make sure we do everything we can to help them. And again, make sure you don't major in the minors. You know, this isn't a witch hunt kind of a thing. And it's not like the Pharisees where you, you know, straining at gnats all day long. You know, you don't dot your I here, you don't cross your T here, and you miss the bigger picture. Make sure you're dealing with the more important things first and foremost. But now let's get to point number two, and it's basically this. If you stand up for the truth, there is going to be a cost that is involved. I mean, look at how the chief priests and the scribes responded to what Jesus did. We read that they began seeking how they might destroy him. Now, standing up for the truth is not necessarily going to make you popular. As a matter of fact, the Bible says it's more likely to bring persecution. Paul said to Timothy in 2 Timothy 3.12, all who live godly in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. And whenever you disagree with someone, you know as well as I do, you run the risk of offending them, of their getting angry with you, especially if what you have to say you know, will cost them in some way. I mean, if you're dealing with somebody who is profiteering from Christianity and you're trying to tell them that it's wrong, you're threatening their money. You're threatening their bank account. They're going to get upset with you. But if you also challenge somebody who may sincerely hold to a particular teaching, they're going to feel threatened as well, and they may get offended at you. You just need to be willing to pay that price. Again, do it graciously. Do it out of love so that the likelihood of offense will be very small. But you need to be willing to run the risk of offense. And the question I believe this passage is asking you this morning as it's asking me is, are you willing to pay that price? Do you love the Lord enough to pay it? When you think about payments for doing what is right, I mean, consider what it costs Jesus to do what was right. You know, these, these leaders of megachurches would tell you that the fact that they have all these thousands of people coming to their church is the sign of God's blessing on their church. I must be doing something right because all these people are coming to my church. Is that necessarily true? Did Jesus do everything right in his ministry? I would say he was the perfect preacher. He said exactly what needed to be said at exactly the right time, and he did it continually. He never made a mistake. And yet at the end of his ministry, did he have a church of thousands of people? You know, he had a handful of disciples that were following him and other scattered secret believers. But the majority of his church of Israel called out for his execution and his blood. If you do things right, it doesn't mean that people are necessarily going to love you, does it? It means that they might actually try to destroy you. Think about the Apostle Paul who went to the Jew first and then to the Gentile. The Gentiles were not the ones that were after him. It was the Jews. And Paul had paid a hefty price for speaking the truth to them. He was stoned on one occasion. It appears that he may have even died and been resurrected. He was beaten on several occasions. They left scars on his body. And actually, he made reference to those scars to the Galatians. And he says, I bear on my body the brand mark of the Lord Jesus Christ. I've been standing in his place. I've been willing to take the punishment that was meant for him. 
Are you willing to do that too? Are you willing to risk contempt and hatred from other people for telling them the truth? That's the question the Lord asks. Now, how much is it going to cost to stand up for the Lord? Well, you really, only the Lord knows the answer to that question, doesn't he? For some people, it costs them their lives. Again, Jesus was crucified. I don't know if you realize it, but Peter died the death of a martyr. At least church history would tell us that's the case. Paul was executed for his work with the Lord. James and John also died. If you're to read Fox's Book of Martyrs, you'll find out that many people actually died at the hands of the Roman church for confessing the truth. Throughout history, there have been hundreds, there have been thousands of Christians who have been martyred for the truth. Now, the exact cost, of course, is in the Lord's hands. Sometimes he doesn't allow anyone to touch you. And other times he does, but whatever he does is good and it's right. But you need to know that God has the right to do whatever he will with you for doing what is right. And you need to let him do that without being afraid. You know, uh, Jonathan Edwards, when he was relatively young, wrote his <clears throat> resolutions. And basically resolutions were the things that he perceived from the scriptures. This is what God wants me to do. And so he'd make a resolution. This is what I'm going to do. And one of his resolutions went something like this. Resolved to do my duty, no matter how many difficulties I have to face. What he was saying in that was basically this, that um, whenever I'm faced with a situation and I know what God's will is, and I, I see the handwriting on the wall, I know if I do this, this is what's going to happen. Actually, he, I'll let me back up. He didn't say I know it, but he says this is very probable this is going to happen. It's not absolute. Only God knows what's going to happen. God's absolutely sovereign. But if I take this course of action, I know this is what's going to happen, but yet this is my duty. I know clearly this is what God would have me to do from his word. He says in a situation like that, I'm going to do what I know is my duty, and I'm going to leave the results in God's hands. So in the case of um, when he had to stand against his grandfather, Solomon Stoddard, in what he had taught for years in the church that, that Stoddard eventually died and Edwards took over his church and Stoddard had this one particular doctrine of teaching that everybody should come to the Lord's table in the hopes that, well, let me back up, not everybody, but um, those who had been raised in the church and were living outwardly godly lives should come to the Lord's table that perhaps they might get grace in order to be saved. They called it converting ordinances. Edwards knew that if he stood against that, because that's not what the Bible teaches, the Lord suffers for God's people, those who have made profession of faith, those who have been received into the membership of the church. If he took a stand on that issue, he knew the people would get angry and they would throw him out of the church. At least that's what he saw coming ahead. And he thought to himself, well, see, I've got this huge family of 11 children, and there's no other place that I can think of that would, that would necessarily have me. Am I willing to take this stand knowing that I'm going to lose my job? I'm going to be thrown out of the church. There may not be any place from anywhere. He said, well, this is God's will. I have to do it. And so he did it. They got angry. They threw him out of the church. Uh, but he did it because it was right. And by the way, the Lord took care of him. He provided another place for him to go where he could actually devote himself to his writings. Um, he was able to accomplish more there because he had a smaller congregation of, of some settlers and some Indians that he was ministering to rather than this huge congregation at Northampton. And so the Lord ended up blessing that work. But the point is, you do it because it's right. And you leave the results in God's hands. What do you think it is that gave Luther the courage to stand against the whole church and to say that this is what the gospel is and to be hunted down, to be declared an outlaw and to basically live a life that was quite difficult? It's because he knew he had to do the right thing. He didn't know whether he was going to live or not. That was in God's hands, and God actually preserved his life. It wasn't an easy life, but everything that Luther experienced, and everything that God allowed into his life, he needed to experience to make Luther the kind of man that he was and so that he would do what it is he did. You know, it was said of uh, General Thomas Jackson, you know, Stonewall Jackson, that... Um, 
when he would take his men into battle, he would sit on his horse. Right in the middle of the, of the bullets that were flying everywhere, he wouldn't take shelter. And his men would see him sitting on the horse with that, that confidence, and it would give them confidence. One time one of his soldiers asked him, how can you sit on your horse in front of all these flying bullets when you're, you're an easy target for the enemy? How can you do that without fear? And Jackson said this, he says, I'm as safe on my horse in the face of the enemy as I am in my bed because I am absolutely and utterly in God's sovereign hands and he will do with me what is pleasing in his sight. So he knew that he was literally indestructible until God should will his death and if God has willed his death, there's nothing he can do to stop it. He trusted God, so he did what he believed was right, what he believed was God's will, without being afraid, because he knew, obeying God, he would be in his hands. Now, you can tell when somebody really believes what it is they're saying. It's when they practice it. And this, again, the same thing is true with regard to you. As long as you are doing what God wills, you are in his hands and you are indestructible until God wills otherwise. And if he wills otherwise, there's really nothing that you can do to stop it. God has a plan. God is sovereign. And he is going to accomplish that plan in your life. You just need to remember that his will is always best, whatever he wills. Whatever situation he puts you in where you have to make a decision, it's good that you're in that place and have to make that decision. And when you decide to do what is God's will and face the consequences for it, that didn't happen accidentally. God did that for a reason so that you would experience those consequences so that God could mold your life and direct it into a particular way. God's absolutely sovereign. These things don't happen accidentally. You just need to learn to trust him. You know, there's a, there was a famous contemporary preacher. His name was James Montgomery Boyce. I think some of you know who he is. He wrote many books. His sermons are still uh, circulating on the Internet and so forth. A few years ago, he got cancer. He went into his liver, and he knew that he only had so many you know, uh, days, weeks to live. And so he addressed his congregation, and he used it as an example. And I think he did it in a very humble way, in a very encouraging way, by the way. He said, I have cancer, I'm dying. But he said, you know what? If I could change my circumstances, if I could be healed right now of this cancer and live for several years longer, he says, I wouldn't, I wouldn't do it, I wouldn't want it. He says, because the fact that I have cancer is God's will. And God's will is best for me. And so I'm content with this. I'm content to live if he wills that I live or die if he wills that I die because his will is best and if I were to change it, I would make it less than best, it would be second best. What God wills is perfect. And to change it in any way is to thwart his perfect will and plan for my life. You see, if we can only live with that kind of an understanding, you know, with that kind of a view, which happens to be right, which happens to be biblical, it'll make a big difference in what we're willing to do. Realizing that every circumstance, every situation we find ourselves in is sovereignly planned by God for a particular reason and our only responsibility is to do his will. If for nothing else, it's a test to see if we are going to do what God tells us to do, if we're going to do the right thing. So getting back to the original question, are you willing to love God enough to stand up for his honor and to do what's right? And are you willing to speak the truth believing that you are in God's hands, that ultimately, you know, whatever he plans is going to be good and right, even if you should suffer? Are you willing even to suffer for doing what is right and to know that it's better that you suffer for that thing in your life, realizing again that God is sovereign, nothing happens by accident. Do you love the Lord enough to do this? You realize that that's really what being a Christian is all about. When Jesus says you need to pick up your cross and follow him, what does he mean by that? 
You cannot be my disciple unless you give up all your possessions and die to yourself and follow me. Does Jesus mean that? Or is that just for some people but not for others? Well, the word disciple, you know, that's Christians were first, the disciples were first called Christians at Antioch. A true Christian is a disciple. A disciple is somebody who has left everything to follow the Lord. It doesn't mean you have to, of course, again, as I mentioned before, get rid of everything that you own and hit the road. But it does mean that everything you do, you do out of love for the Lord and desire to glorify him. That is what being a Christian is. And really, I think that's what made the difference between those who took their mina and made more minas, took their talent and made more talents, and the one who didn't. The ones who made more were the ones who loved him and were willing to do what he told them to do regardless of the consequences, whereas the one who kept the mina and buried it was the one who took his Christianity and hid it from other people and didn't step out and do anything the Lord called him to do because he was afraid that something bad was going to happen to him and he didn't want to pay the price. Well, don't let that happen to you. If that is the case with you, you need to realize that the only way you're going to cure that fear and get that love that you need to give you that zeal to stand up for him is if you trust Jesus Christ and turn from your sins. If you do that, the Lord will grant you the grace to do this. I mean, he doesn't tell you to do this on your own. It's not something you have to muster up the strength for in yourself. It's something he will give you if you're willing to come to him and trust him and serve him. And for those of you who do love him but are finding, yeah, like the rest of us, this, this is kind of a hard saying, you know, this is difficult. What can I do about it? Well, again, that's what the evening sermons have been all about, isn't it? Uh, how do we get more love for the Lord to put off more of our sins and to put on more of the Lord Jesus Christ? Well, so far we've seen a couple of things you need to you know, fall out of love with the world. Stop going after the world and embracing those things because that's pouring water on the fire of your love. And begin stoking that furnace by praying continually and asking God for that grace, reading his word in faith, receiving and applying what it is the word of God says. And this evening we're going to see by giving yourself wholly to him in worship, making your whole life one continuous act of of worship to the Lord, which is in essence what we've been looking at this morning, isn't it? That's what Jesus did. He wasn't a part-time Christian or a part-time Messiah or a part-time Christ. He was a full-time Christ, right? He didn't just, you know, turn it off sometimes and go and play over here and, you know, indulge in these things and then kind of snap back in it and get back on track and then go off over here. Jesus stayed the course continually from point A to B, everything he did was honoring to the Lord. That's exactly what he wants our lives to be. He doesn't want us to be part-time Christians. He wants us to be full-time Christians. Now, we're going to look at that more fully the, this evening, so I won't say anything more about that now. Except this, may the Lord give each of us the grace that we need to love him enough to stand up for him and to be willing to pay the price that we may have to pay for so doing. It's only if we do this that the cause of Jesus, his kingdom, is going to advance in the world and we're going to see less of all this wickedness that we read about in the papers and that we cringe at and that we're offended at every single day. It's only if the kingdom of heaven advances that that is going to retreat and it's only going to advance if we love the Lord enough to stand up for his cause. So let Jesus, again, be your example this morning as he is in everything else of his willingness to love his Father, to stand up for his honor, regardless of the cost. May God give us the grace to follow in his steps. Well, let's, uh, let's bow in a moment of silent prayer and let's ask the Lord to help us do that.